Hi everybody, it's Whitney from All the Shelves. I'm here with the second part of my February wrap up. If you're interested in what I read in the first half of February, I will link that video down below, but this is everything I read from the 14th through the 29th of February. The first thing that I read was The Crimson Petal and the White by Michelle Faber. I read this for a very good reason, which was that I was re-watching Gilmore Girls, and there's that really good episode where Emily Gilmore is reading this book for her book club, and for reasons that I don't want to give away, she has just completely given up on life for a little while, and she starts talking about this book that she's reading, and she's like, it's about a prostitute named Sugar, and it reminded me everything that I had heard about this book, and if it is the book that Emily Gilmore reads when she's falling apart then I wanted to be a part of that. So I went into it with some expectations. I knew it was going to be about a prostitute named Sugar, so I expected it to be very body and kind of raucous. And since it was set in a kind of Victorian setting, I thought it would be like kind of gross sexuality. And I was looking forward to that kind of book that grossed me out for whatever reason. That's what I was in the mood for. And this isn't quite that. There are scenes that are kind of like that. There's some like real gross out prostitute sex, exactly what you would expect from those kinds of scenes. Um, but there is also these other plot lines that are going on at the same time. Probably so many people have read this by now, so you're not like learning anything new. But but I learned something new about it when I found that the book also contained these like religious subplots um, and had a lot to do with how women were contained in different kinds of spaces in Victorian culture. I thought it was going to be like how prostitutes were contained and it's also about how like ladies are contained or religious ladies are contained. But even though that wasn't quite the book that I was looking for, it was the book I got and I'm glad I got it. But as a result, I kind of moved slowly through this one. Every time that the book was actually about sugar, I found it really compelling, really exciting, really interesting and embodied and from a perspective that I hadn't really seen before. So I really appreciated those parts of the book and then when it was more about the religious setting, I felt like I had read that book before or I had read about those kinds of themes before so those weren't as compelling. Now juxtaposing the two together was quite interesting and I ended up giving this book a four star out of five star on Goodreads rating which is high for me so um, it's not like I disliked it and I do want to read more Michelle Faber especially under the skin but I'm also afraid that this book is going to disappear for me quite quickly even a couple weeks later I'm starting to forget parts, um, which is unfortunate because it was so long. What a time commitment, you know? The next thing that I read in November was a play by Horton Foote called The Young Man from Atlanta, and Horton Foote wrote one of my very favorite movies, which is called Tender Mercies. Robert Duvall is in it, and he gives this really amazing performance, and it's this quiet, southern kind of um, exploration of spirituality and family. Anyway, the movie is, is so excellent, so every once in a while I will read one of Horton Foote's plays, because he's quite prolific, and this one was really good. It's about a man and a woman whose son has committed suicide, and they aren't quite clear on the details of his death and the man at the very beginning of the play loses his job because it's like a tough economy and um, the wife in the meantime has been giving all of this money, all of her extra savings to a friend of her son who appears to be some kind of like con artist or have some kind of weird relationship with their son or perhaps some sort of nice relationship with their son but nobody can quite parse what's going on. I thought it was quiet, it was nice. It explored some of those nuances of humanity that sometimes go unexplored, you know, just the just the way that husbands and wives interact and how they might deal with grief together. And somehow it kind of reminded me of Robert Frost. I would love to see a Horton Foot play produced, but I actually never have. Um, so it was in this collection. I just read one of them, but I'll be reading the other two probably this month. The next book that I read was a trip. It was Octavia Butler's Fledgling. This is my fourth Octavia Butler novel. I have read Wild Seed, Dawn, and Kindred, and now I've read Fledgling. I want to read everything that Octavia Butler has written. I think she is brilliant, 
This to me was not one of her more brilliant books. The themes here were fascinating, but I've seen her do those before, even in the few books that I have read, and the writing style was a little bit repetitive, and weirdly my book had like a million typos. Like every three pages there was a really glaring typo that I caught. It's not like I'm overly picky about grammar or anything like that. These were really bad typos where sometimes you couldn't even understand what the sentence was supposed to mean because of the typo, which gave it this weird unfinished quality to the writing that I really didn't like. It felt like I was reading um, a first draft. But the story itself starts out so interesting. So this girl wakes up suddenly. She doesn't know where she is. She doesn't seem to be able to see anything. Her senses are all screwed up. Um, she knows she attacks something. She has this like intense hunger and over the next few pages you come to realize that she is a vampire in the process of regeneration. So she like feels her head and there's soft spots and she's covered in scar tissue but it's slowly starting to go away and heal itself. So she kind of makes her way out into the world and she is stopped by this man. I, I think he's in his early 20s was what I understood from it and he picks her up on the side of the road and there's this immediate sexual attraction now she looks like a 10 or 11 year old little girl and he looks like a 20 year old man in the process of unpacking who this person is you find out that the vampire is actually 53 years old that makes her an adult according to human terms still a child according to vampiric terms, and certainly a child in what we understand to be the embodiment of childhood, so it's very, very uncomfortable. She has this penetrating because of the because of the vampire teeth relationship with this man and she's got um, a sexual relationship with him. She's a child and it's an interracial relationship not only because she is a vampire and he is a human but because she is black and he is white. So there's like all of these boundaries being crossed, all of these uncomfortable violations of certain social norms and you learn all about her vampire culture which is weird and unsettling and I loved that part of the book. It was just this style of the writing that I didn't really respond to. Very stilted, um, very repetitive, and I think and I think that this book could have been better, which is what's so frustrating about it, because I would love an excellent vampire novel for a more contemporary audience, and this just wasn't quite it for me. On audiobook in the second part of this month, I listened to The Silkworm. In the first half of the month, I just breezed through Cuckoo's Calling, the first in the Cormorant Strike series. I was just really excited about this series, and I wanted to keep going with it and learn more about these characters, um, and I was really, I was so not disappointed with the silkworm. Not only did I still like the characters and respond to them, but there is increasing autonomy and accountability for the female character, and this book was about publishing and books and fandom and authorship in ways that are just fascinating for a mystery story and especially for a mystery story written by somebody who has had to deal with fandom and fanfic and authorship issues. So I'll be doing a longer review of The Silkworm just because I was so impressed with it and I'll be matching that up with a review of Tana French's Broken Harbor which I've just finished and that'll come out next week. But for now I want to say that these audiobooks are excellent. The narrator who I will name down below because I am forgetting his name. I know his first name is also Robert, <laughs> but that's not that helpful. Anyway, this narrator is so good. He reads at a really good pace. He distinguishes voices really well without having that high-pitched, weak, breathy sounding female voice that sometimes male narrators do. The only issue I had with his narration was that there is an American character in the silkworm and his American accent was just like atrocious. Um, I forgive him because Americans' British accents are probably much worse, but this one was really bad. It was like I couldn't decide if he was from Georgia or Texas or like Boston. It just it had no consistency to it. Uh, but such a minor character and such a minor detail, I would definitely recommend listening to these on audio. 
A book that I read for work this month was Seduction of the Innocent by Frederick Wortham. It sounds more exciting than it is, trust me. This was the 1953 polemic against comic books and especially crime comic books. I've read so much about this book and it seemed silly that I hadn't actually read the primary source so I finally read it. Um, he says that Batman is gay with Robin. He says that Wonder Woman is anti-masculine and gives girls lesbian fantasies. He says that Superman is a fascist and that comic books inspire kids to do all sorts of violent, horrible things like especially poke each other's eyes out. He's like obsessed with the idea that kids are poking each other's eyes out more in the 50s than they ever were before apparently. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and say that none of his ideas are correct. In fact, I think that Batman and Robin might have some kind of queer relationship and that that is an awesome thing and gives people so many avenues for identification and that Wonder Woman is totally anti-masculine because for Marston, masculinity meant fear and it meant violence and it meant cowardice, whereas femininity was about love and power and instruction. So I'm not one of the people that says that Wortham was totally wrong. It was just that the tone of his interpretations was obviously wrong and that the result of his interpretations led to years of the comic book industry self-censoring, which led to some interesting developments but also some unfortunate developments. And speaking of comics, I read a few things in trade paperback. I read a million individual issues of things, but in this wrap-up I will be talking about the trade paperbacks that I read and then I'll save my issue recommendations for my weekly comics videos. So I read Cowl Volume 1, which is one of those kind of like meta superhero comics where there's a group of superheroes who work for the city and you kind of see the inner workings of the organization. There was some really interesting stuff about unions and striking, but for the most part I think that this has been done before and it's been done better and if you really want a kind of commentary on superheroes you should probably go to Watchmen. Um, and this was seemed a little bit derivative of Watchmen to me. And the other trade paperbacks that I read all in one day were the five volumes of Saga. I still have a few issues now to get caught up with. I went and picked those up, but I'm almost all caught up with Saga. It is as good as everybody is talking about. The art is just really clear and bright and really cute. Like my favorite character is Goose and he is just the cutest little seal in yellow fisherman pants I've ever seen. Just adorable. Um, and of course the main character Marco. I'm having some really strange like Robin Hood from that Disney movie with the fox. Uh, kind of attractions to Marco. He's an alien and he has horns and so I feel weird about it. Please tell me I am not alone in that. But he is like ridiculously sexy. And the girl from this is also just totally beautiful. I like having those kinds of responses to cartoons even though it is admittedly a little bit weird. I'm really loving this series. I'm not quite ready to talk about it in detail. I think that there is as there is in all science fiction, some very interesting connections to the real world that we live in. And I think that part of the success of the series is the artistic style. Part of the success of the series is how broad the scope is without getting confusing. Um, and part of the success is how little words are on the page, but how big of a story they're able to tell. I think that's something that works really well in this series. So that is everything that I read in the second half of February. I am looking forward to March. I have a lot of mysteries lined up. I've been in a mystery mood. People have been talking about mysteries on YouTube. There are a couple um, mystery challenges, uh, which I'll link down below. So if you want to join in and reading a bunch of mysteries. I don't think I'll do like a TBR video or anything like that because I don't want to get stressed out about the things that I have to read because I announced it to the you know few people who watch my videos but um, I will be reading some mysteries and doing some reviews of those. This month I feel like I've read a lot of really popular books so if you have read any of these please leave me comments down below. I am really enjoying talking to you about all of the books that we're reading and all the books that we have in common and the recommendations we have for each other. This has just been really fun. So I will see you in my next video.